The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Tonight on The Agenda. Online violence is violence. For young people, this can entail self-harm or even suicide. And this is about responding to platforms that amplify and circulate content in a way that normalizes hate. Then, later on the agenda. So there are thousands of people that died that were in our report who likely use drugs recreationally, occasionally, but because of how potent and unpredictable that supply is, they're at risk of dying every time they use that supply. Also tonight. As an artist, all you can possibly do is try to bring somebody face to face with your work for a moment, just to be in the moment. Views about social media vary widely, from a cesspool that brings out the worst in people to indispensable sites of modern communication. The federal government recently introduced legislation aimed, it says, at making the online universe much less of a toxic brew. Bill C-63, the Online Harms Act, would tackle abuse with serious consequences for hate crimes, including possible prison time. With us now on what's needed to make Canadians safer in the digital world, we are joined by Sabrina Dellen. She is Chief Executive Officer of the Samara Centre for Democracy. Barbara Perry, Director at the Centre on Hate, Bias and Extremism at Ontario Tech University. And Dax Dorazio, who is a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Political Studies at Queen's University. And it's great to have you two on the ends back here and you here for the first time. Thanks for joining us. Let's just set the table here. What's this bill, Sabrina, trying to do? So the purpose of this bill is to protect children from hateful content that's online. And what that entails is policing seven different forms of content or hate speech, and also establishing a digital safety commission that's gonna be tasked with regulating large platforms. So this matters because Online violence is violence. For young people, this can entail self-harm or even suicide. And this is about responding to platforms that amplify and circulate content in a way that normalizes hate, puts our youth at risk, and threatens our democracy. So what we have here is something that's informed by other countries that are further along in how they've developed protections for their citizens, and also something that's been shaped by the insights of civil society researchers who have been working to hold these platforms to account. In your view, is it genuinely only aimed at young people? I think there is a, a spillover effect to the general population at large. If we're looking at protections for kids, it's also going to affect the grown-ups in their lives as well. We know, especially during the course of the pandemic, kids are increasingly online and the grown-ups in their world have been kind of outmaneuvered in terms of how they're handling technology. There's a broader concern around digital media literacy that is of national relevance. Um, so this is something that does affect all of us. Dax, how about in your view? Is this genuinely a aimed exclusively at preventing harm to children? Not exclusively, no. I think there are actually two elements of the bill here. So one is what I would describe as really non-controversial, which is improving the transparency and accountability of digital platforms. And that essentially brings Canada in line with comparator countries who have created similar online harms legislation to create some sort of regulatory framework. And digital media companies, digital platforms actually want want to work with governments to figure out where those reasonable limits for expression would be online. There's almost universal consensus that the status quo is untenable for Canadian digital regulations in this specific sphere. In this specific sphere. So that's non-controversial. The potentially controversial bits of the bill are the amendments to um, hate speech prohibitions. So the amendments to the criminal code specifically and also the amendments to the Canadian Human Rights Act. Can I ask you about that? Is there truly a, a consensus that the status quo is untenable and something has to be done? 
I don't think there is a consensus. Uh, I think that there is a divide. There's incredible polarization around uh, what constitutes hate speech, uh, around the need to regulate it, uh, the sense that it's uh, free expression. Um, I, I, I drive a, uh, draw a fine line between hate speech and, and free speech, and I think about it as dangerous speech, and this is what it's intended uh, to address, is speech that, and this is a nice thing, where there's a definition now of hate. Uh, so it's speech that uh, vilifies or represents detestation uh, associated with the community. So I think um, very important there from from some perspectives, but uh, but not all. Uh, Can I just and jump I, in on that? Yeah. You really think it's a fine line? I think well, sorry, it's it's actually an increasingly blurred line. Uh, I think what has what has refined it um, are, and this is where the definition comes from that they've included. What has refined it is a success of court decisions which have tried to define hate, and we've had a, a Canadian Human Rights Tribunal case that has also distilled those into eleven hallmarks of hate, which are informing uh, that definition. So th this is an attempt, I think, to make that uh, a finer line, uh, if you will, to draw that distinction more clearly. Can we talk about that line for a second, about how either fine or squishy or hazy or what was the word you used? Blurry. Blurry. <laughs> Whether it's blurry about the difference between legitimate, offensive, but legal speech and what's truly hateful and illegal. Yeah, I mean, you know, I want to talk about the Canadian Race Relations Foundation's uh, poll from 2021 that found that 79% of Canadians want to see uh, hateful speech online and racism addressed with the same level of seriousness as in-person hate crimes. Mm. And at the Samara Centre, we've been monitoring, studying and quantifying the ugliness of political conversations online. And so we know that they have a chilling effect on the public. It pushes people away instead of drawing them in. That's a freedom of speech and expression issue as well. I think another element to bring into this is not just the freedom of speech, but also freedom of reach, which is getting at mm. the extent that these platforms are able to share content that's likely out of proportion to its prevalence in the real world. Let me come at it from another side, Barbara, which is even if you manage to find some kind of consensus, which you two may disagree on whether or not it exists, do you have confidence that the big social media companies, Meta, for example, would actually play ball here and enforce the rules that a passed bill would tell them they have to enforce? Well, I think we've seen resistance in other countries, so that is uh, going to be, I think, part of the, the battle here uh, in the role of the commissions that are struck, is to engage with those companies um, to consider uh, how to bring them to the table more fully. I mean, they have been at the table, right? They've been part of this conversation. They've expressed the resistance, but I think they've also expressed, to some extent, how far they are willing to go. Um, so I think there's still a lot of negotiation that needs to be done there. And and, and I think you suggested, you know, that they're, they're willing to have that conversation. Dax? I think the basic problem here when it comes to regulating hate speech or having hate pro prohibitions is that we have the criminal code, which is in some sense insufficient. It essentially plays whack-a-mole with the most concerning extremists in Canada. The threshold of harm, which is hate, is really high in the criminal code. It requires the consent of an attorney general, for example, to lay criminal charges and arguably police, when they are investigating hate, have a bit of a, um, they go light. You only see the most concerning extreme forms of hate being prosecuted in Canada. Statutory human rights protections uh, have a role to play in mitigating discrimination, but the threshold of the bar is slightly lower for the Canadian Human Rights um, Act um, and the commission and the tribunal. There's something positive in the sense that it increases access to justice. Somebody doesn't have to go to the police to file a complaint and rely upon the discretion of the police and the Crown to lay criminal charges. The problem is that the most concerning hate speech is not just on the, is not just an outlier at the far edges of public discourse in Canada. We see it trickle into the mainstream and we have, just because something isn't illegal doesn't mean that it's not harmful to society and corrode our public discourse and, and push people that are targets of hate speech um, outside of public discourse. So they feel like they can't contribute. So navigating that fine line is really difficult. And I, I, I'm expecting to see a lot of pushback and a lot of controversy in reanimating specifically Section 13 of the Canadian Human Rights Act, which was repealed um, almost a decade ago. Mm -hmm. 
And there was a quite animated public debate about the merits of that legislation. And in, in that debate, several legitimate questions about freedom of expression were raised. And well, I th okay, let me follow up on that with you, Sabrina, because I think we understand as we watch this debate unfold that we're trying to figure out a balancing act here, right? Mm -hmm. On the one hand, we want to have robust free speech in a Western-style parliamentary democratic system. On the other hand, you know, we, we do have to watch out that hate speech doesn't turn into murderous behavior and lead to really awful things. This bill's trying to find a balance. Mm -hmm. How well is it doing at finding that balance? I mean, this is very complex and nuanced territory. One single piece of legislation, even something as complex as this, is not going to solve this problem mm -hmm. outright. Two pieces that I think are of significance for uh, the public interest is the creation of this regulator. There's been some concern about the wind raging powers. Uh, what will it look like in terms of a user experience to have somewhere to go with these complaints? Because as Dax has noted, right now people just have the police to go to, mm -hmm. and it doesn't feel sufficient or it doesn't feel like it's really quite satisfying or resolving the problem in a in a useful way. There's also um, the possibility of creating an ombuds, ombuds person, which would be an advocate for the victims. And so what we have here is an evolution culturally and socially in terms of how we frame this problem, giving the public a destination, processes, ways to even just have language to describe that this is truly a problem. There's still a sense that what happens online isn't really real, isn't really that bad. What are you supposed to do? So there's a legitimizing uh, aspect to this that's of use for victims, but it's also something that we should expect and hope to evolve, um, especially as our understanding of technology's influence on our communities and our democracy uh, increases. Let me pick up on the angle of the regulator because we have seen in the past where the current federal government appoints people to make decisions about how they're going to dispense money, for example, and conservatives understandably think you've skewed the deck here and you're only giving to your friends, etc. Uh, you, you've interpreted things to coincide with your particular ideology. And if in the future the conservatives form the government, uh, I'm sure liberals will say, you know, you've, you've appointed a regulator who only sees things your way and, and isn't giving our side a fair shake here. What do we do about that? Well, the partisanship is is problematic in this space in particular. Um, we know the harms that online hate is doing. We see it in terms of the just the direct harm of the speech itself on youth and adults as well, who are members of marginalized and, and detested uh, and vilified communities. Um, but I think we also see the harm in terms of the relationship between online, online action and offline action in the mass murders that we've seen uh, associated with the far right activism, for example example. Um, most of the mass, well, all of the, the mass homicides that we've had in the past seven years or so have been motivated by people or committed by people who have been engaging online and have been radicalized online. So there's two sides in terms of the harm to the, the, to the victims, but also the risk that it poses in terms of mobilizing and normalizing, as I think you've referred to, normalizing those narratives in a way that carries into our offline interactions with people. Uh, so I think that we need to put that partisanship uh, aside to acknowledge those harms. What government uh, is going to put partisanship well, aside in yes, choosing a regulator? Gone are the days. You know. Yeah, yeah. Um, but this is, and, and we've seen, I mean, we have seen people across party lines, not leaders necessarily, but we have seen MPs uh, themselves come forward and, you know, support it ac across the floor. So I think that we need to see uh, more of that cooperation. Not going to happen, I think, around the, the, regula the regulator piece, mm. um, because I think there's suspicion of, uh, Obviously, uh, you know, we're talking about removing big government uh, and replacing it with smaller government. I think that that is going to be really one of the pressure points uh, in these debates. Okay, let's come back to where we started here, which was talking about a bill designed to protect younger people from the abuse that they suffer online. And I want to share some stats here. Uh, Sheldon, we're on page two in the middle. Let's bring this graphic up here. These are some stats from Statistics Canada about the impact that uh, online hate has on younger people. And here we go. More than 7 in 10 young people have been exposed to online hate and violence. 7 in 10. Nearly one quarter of victims of cyber-related hate crimes are young people aged 12 to 17. A quarter? Teenage boys aged 12 to 17 are six times more likely than teenage girls to be charged or accused, charged with or accused of a cyber-related hate crime, 
And uh, as anybody who spends any time online will know, young women are most often the victims of online harassment. What is it, okay, Barbara, I'm coming back to you. What is it about the cyber landscape that seems to make young people disproportionate purveyors and victims of this stuff? I think there are so many factors that come into play here. There is uh, the breadth of the conversations and narratives, so you feel like you're not the only one who has that feeling, that um, that attitude, that perception, so it feels safe. Uh, I, it feels safe just to be behind uh, the computer that you can, in spite of the fact that you're not, you're not anonymous, there's a feeling of anonymity uh, in that space. So again, that's another thing that makes you feel safe and free to express yourself uh, as you would. Uh, and I think that there's also the, you know the the affected voices and the the often the the um, what sympathetic voices are often silenced uh, yeah. and so the louder voices are probably the most harmful and the most damaging and, and the so most that, amplified yeah absolutely and so again it, it per, uh, permits others to express themselves in a similar way even sometimes even if they don't uh, if they don't uh, believe it uh, but as a way of being part of the crowd mm. uh, so I think there are so many factors there that we have to consider uh, in terms of why people feel so free uh, to engage in that way online, mm. which they wouldn't do face to face, most people. They never do. They're yeah. not that gutsy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I shouldn't say never. Most often yeah. not. Dax, you're on a post secondary campus as well. You see the impact this has on younger people in your daily activities? Absolutely, I do. What does it look like? Well, there's also an algorithmic component, which is. Previously, if you wanted information, you could go to the library, you'd pick out a book off of a shelf. Now you can get into a pipeline of extremism quite easily where even innocently stumbling upon some content online, the algorithm will very sneakily just keep pitching you yeah. sometimes what appears to be edgy content that might be entertaining. And that's how perceptions are, are shifted. As far as just digital media use in general, I think we're now catching up to reality and having what I think is a nuanced conversation about navigating a really healthy relationship with technology. And this is really important for youth these days. You know, walking around the Queen's campus, for example, I'll sometimes see people walk into a lamppost staring at their phone, and <laughs> that might be funny at the moment. Um, but when I look at the relationship that students are navigating with technology, it's a brave new world compared to what I experienced. I remember dial up internet and the exhilaration of the internet just blossoming, and now it looks like a toxic hellscape in, in some instances. And I really feel for youth who are navigating that because the expressive landscape is just so different. There's been a death of nuance. There's been a death of charity. Um, and on university campuses, we're trying to instill something that you might call intellectual humility or civic virtue, how to express themselves across difference and be sensitive to other people, other identities, other experiences. Online, it's very difficult to be intellectually curious. And so universities have a huge role to play in instilling some of those values in quick, society. Quick follow up with you. Do you find that young people are so into their phones now and are uh, perhaps inappropriately communicating uh, in a very aggressive, violent way on their phones with each other, they have actually lost the art of civilized mm -hmm. conversation? Do you see that? I don't want to channel my inner boomer here <laughs> and just say those darn kids these days. Um, I see some very unhealthy engagements with the online digital environment, for sure. Um, also, when you look at the rates of uh, experiencing mental health, especially among younger cohorts or the younger generation, I think there's an intimate link between online environments and, and struggling with, with mental health concerns as well. I think what needs to happen, and perhaps parts of this bill are one way of at least starting the conversation or creating a regulatory framework for this, is that when people are using digital media platforms, they're actually aware of some of the risks that are latent, and for some users, obvious. People should be cognizant of some of the risks and also the benefits of using technology, and we're really catching up to that conversation, I think. Go ahead. I, I'd like to add, you know, there are obviously harms online, and youth definitely need to be protected. Youth often get criticized for being apathetic and not civically engaged, and they are not interested in joining a political party. Maybe they're not going to come out and vote, but they do use uh, technology towards civic ends in a way that is of use to our society and is 
of benefit to their mental health and well-being. Give and us an in, example of this. Uh, well, actually, during the pandemic, it was youth that were mobilizing and sharing information about how to keep their communities healthy and safe. It was youth that were talking about mobilizing around global movements, Black Lives Matter, um, climate change. They are very much engaged and able to use digital spaces in a healthy way. They can model better behaviors for the grown-ups in their lives as well. Mm -hmm. It's not just doom and gloom and horrendous. Certainly there's an aspect of that that needs to be addressed. But this type of legislation has the capacity to address those horrible things, but also restore some of the pro-democracy aspects of these platforms and provide conditions for healthy and productive civic conversations. And we can take some cues from young people here. Your organization focuses on democracy and democratic engagement and how we can contribute to a better, you know, a better sense around all of that. And I guess part of that mission is sort of promoting the circumstances that would allow for people to feel good about putting their name on a ballot and standing for office, which not a lot of people feel good about today. So my question is, what kind of impact do you think all of this hate speech, toxicity, call it what you want, is having on the... Oh, I, I resist using this word, but I'm sorry. Like, mm -hmm. the quality of people who are prepared to stand for office today. Yeah, one concern is that, you know, if this is what it's like, we're going to attract people who can just keep their elbows out in these types of conditions and aren't going to be able to solve other kinds of complex problems that we need a hand with right now. At the Samara Center, uh, we have a study where we've tracked uh, abusive content received by candidates in Canadian elections uh, on X, formerly Twitter. We've done this in federal, provincial, and municipal elections. And we've been able to quantify that it's a condition of work on the digital campaign trail to get identity attacks, threats, and sexually explicit content your way. Um, you're going to get the most of it if you have a very high profile and or if you're underrepresented in our democracy, if you're from a community like that. So this is going to affect who runs. It's also going to affect who stays. We have exit interviews with former members of parliament that speak to this in detail. But then there's also this broader chilling effect on civic engagement because all of that content is readily available to everybody online. It's publicly accessible and it sends a signal that you should stay away from these conversations when there's really such tremendous opportunity for these tools to be drawing people in. Um, and so, you know, with this type of legislation is an opportunity to kind of shift these working conditions, create a different culture, um, evolve how we use these tools, get some control back, some sense back. Mm. Um, and I think the regulator has an important role to play here in working uh, to represent the public interest, which really has been quite absent from our understanding so far. You will not be surprised to hear, Barbara, that I spend too much time talking to politicians. And I'm not sure I've talked to any, regardless of political stripe, who say they don't feel uh, threatened at some point in their day mm -hmm. by people who are hateful online and who would want to do them serious harm. Mm -hmm. And I think we all have, uh, I suspect we all remember that image of a guy who looked about 6'2 and 250 pounds going after five foot tall Christian Freeland at an mm -hmm. elevator in mm -hmm. Alberta, mm -hmm. where her, I mean, as it turned out, her life wasn't threatened, but she didn't know that at that moment. So this is a problem. How much do you think we can really legislate out of existence some of the difficulties we're talking about here? Well, I think it's part of a broader strategy. You know, the government likes to talk about a whole government response. I like to talk about a whole of society response, that it is uh, the, the work, for example, that civil society organizations are doing in this space in terms of working and supporting victims, whether that's individuals or communities, in terms of providing strategies around critical digital literacy, all of those pieces, the, the work that even, you know, folks in, in the academy, uh, like Dax, for instance, are, are doing uh, in this space is so important. And I think if, if if, if anything else, um, the, you know, the, the importance of government support for that activity, um, providing infrastructure funding, providing supports and, and guidance uh, and advice, I think that is so important to continuing the good work that's always going on, also already going on. 
on the ground in those organizations. So this legislation, I think, is, is part of that package uh, and will help to inform some of those strategies that people will be engaging in down the road in terms of um, you know, how to apply the legislation. So training with law enforcement, for example, about how to think about the legislation, because that's been obviously one of the shortcomings is the failure to enforce the legislation we already have. Um, so uh, you know, enhanced education that can come from civil society or you know the academy uh, in in, in that space, so there are so many pieces uh, to this puzzle that we add on to the legislation. Give the Fed some advice, Dax, in our last minute here. I'd be happy to, and it'll be really interesting to see how this uh, pitch legislation actually shakes out in the committee stage. I worry that there will be a backlash specifically in response to the amendments to the Criminal Code and the Canadian Human Rights Act, and I think that'll be the fulcrum of the debate as it plays out. I think, as I mentioned before, the stuff related to making digital platforms accountable and transparent and using an almost duty of care concept to protect users is merited and that can find some consensus. What I really would like to see is perhaps a more artful way to make those amendments. What happened previously with the demise of Section 13 is that nobody really cared about prosecuting white supremacists or expression that found itself on the margins of public discourse. Sometimes that trickles in, obviously, but if complaints are made and there are respondents in those complaints where the expression at issue is further towards the mainstream, people will see that as an illegitimate restriction of their expression and free expression. And my worry is that what will happen is that that specific debate and controversy and backlash will prejudice and perhaps even jeopardize the enterprise as a whole. So I would separate these two things personally. Last quick word to you on this as well. Give the Fed some advice. Um, civil society organizations and citizens assemblies have played such a key role in shaping this response. They should continue to play a role in having their insights applied because this response needs to evolve and be refined over time. So taking an iterative posture here I think is key. Gotcha. I want to thank Sabrina Dellen from the Samaro Center for Democracy, Dax Durazio from Queen's University, Barbara Perry from Ontario Tech University for joining us here for, if I may say, a very civilized discussion about a very controversial topic. So thank you all for that. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thanks. People in this province who died from a substance-related overdose faced substantial gaps in treatment. That according to a new report tracking how the health care system serves this population. Tara Gomes is an epidemiologist and principal investigator at the Ontario Drug Policy Research Network. She is co-author of the report done in partnership with Public Health Ontario. And Tara Gomes joins us now. It's good to have you back here. Thanks, Tara. Although every time we invite you here, it's because there's not necessarily good news to talk about. And that's where we're going here. Here are some more numbers. Ontario, 10,000 accidental substance toxicity deaths. 10,000 between 2018 and 2022, with a 72% spike in the last year. What explains this? It's a great question. I think... There are probably two main things that have happened in the last couple of years that are driving these these rising tragic deaths, which is really, I think, what we need to focus on is these are preventable tragic deaths. The first is that in around 2015 or 2016, our illicit or unregulated drug supply changed. It used to be mainly heroin, and fentanyl came into that supply. We all talk about fentanyl now, but when that arrived, its potency really started to lead to rising deaths. And with that, we not only now have fentanyl in that supply, we have fentanyl analogs, which can be more potent. We have other sedatives, tranquilizers, all kinds of other substances that are being mixed into that supply, which is making it so unpredictable that when people use it from day to day, they might be getting a very different combination of drugs at very different potencies that can make it incredibly dangerous for them to regulate and figure out how to keep themselves safe. Fast follow up on that. Is it all coming in from the States? It is not necessarily coming in from the States. It is being made here. It is coming in from across borders. The problem is that the way that this is all being mixed together means that it doesn't really matter where it's coming from. We can't stop this at our borders. These are chemicals that can be manufactured anywhere. And so we can't really stop this by enforcement and just 
closing our borders to these drugs or finding ways to prevent them, we are going to continue to have this unpredictable drug supply if we can't find a way to create access to alternatives for people. It's okay. unfortunately the circumstance we're I in I interrupted now. you. You're going to continue and tell us some other reasons why the spike. Well, the, I think the other piece on top of this unpredictable supply is that the pandemic arrived. Just the elephant in the room. We saw, saw changes in how people could access community-based services. People were kind of taken away from their networks of support, moved around to different parts of the city or the province. And that really changed the way that we could respond to keeping people safe. So you take an unpredictable supply that continues to get worse and you take you know, the removal and, and lowered accessibility of the, these community-based programs and services, and it's a perfect storm for these harms to continue to increase. Mm. Presumably, treatment works. So what's the big stumbling block to getting more treatment for more people that need it? It's an important question because we talk a lot about treatment. It absolutely works. There is evidence to support treatments like methadone and suboxone. These are medications people can be prescribed to provide them with treatment. That's great, and it can help prevent people from having an overdose if they use these treatments. However, these treatments don't always work because they're very regimented in how people have to access them. Most of the time, people have to go every day to a pharmacy. If you can imagine, try to hold down a job, get your kids to school, take care of kids at home, go on vacation. If you have to be at a pharmacy every single day for an observed dose of a treatment, it's really hard for people to stay in these programs. And they're not always adapting in doses to the supply that people are being exposed to so people might go into withdrawal even if they're in treatment. But the other thing that I think we really need to build into this conversation is, and our report showed this, not everybody who's dying is eligible for treatment. Only about two-thirds of people have a diagnosis of a substance use disorder, so an addiction, that would make them eligible for treatment. So there are thousands of people that died that were in our report who likely use drugs recreationally, occasionally, but because of how potent and unpredictable that supply is, they're at risk of dying every time they use that supply. And that's why we can't just focus on treatment. We also have to think about harm reduction, how we provide people with safe spaces to use drugs, safer supplies of drugs, so that we actually can help prevent all of the circumstances of the deaths that are happening right now in the province. That is a highly controversial issue. I don't have to tell you. And not every political party in this country agrees on uh, the advisability of taking that approach. Mm -hmm. So let me give you a chance to make the case for why you think safe injection sites, while, what's the word I'm looking for? While problematic to some, may actually be the way to go here. Absolutely. So safe consumption sites are one of the responses that we've seen roll out in the province. These are safe spaces for people to use drugs. So if they use a substance and they overdose, there's somebody there to intervene, which is so important. Three quarters of the people who die from an opioid or other substance related death were alone when they died. And that is a huge element of this issue. So there's some supervision on these sites. Exactly. There are people there who are trained to help respond. And there's evidence. And I think this is what's very difficult because this has become such a politicized topic. If we take the politics out of this, there are studies, one that just came out based in Ontario earlier this year that shows that communities where supervised consumption sites open end up having lower rates of overdoses in those communities and they're sustained over the long term. So there is real evidence and research that is showing that these sites work. But instead of listening to that, we have this moral dialogue around, you know, people should just not use drugs, that there's this stigma usually rooted around people using drugs that, that interferes with these conversations around what actually the evidence shows could work and help prevent these deaths. And so my hope is that we can really start to focus more on conversations around evidence um, as opposed to some of the rhetoric that's swirling around these sites. Okay, let me pick up on this notion of consumption and treatment services. 17, I gather, mm -hmm. centers around the province. Does that do enough? I would, the short answer is, is no. We have many more than 17 communities across the province who are experiencing harms from substance use. And there are many that are trying to open sites and can't get approvals and funding for them. And unfortunately, right now, we're in a situation where there are two sites who don't have funding and will close at the end of this month if they don't secure funding where for those sites. Those are in Sudbury and in Timmins, two areas where we know that there are enormously high rates of opioid-related deaths, and these sites are needed. And I'm personally, and I know people who 
work in these sites and who rely on these sites are afraid. We're afraid of what will happen if these sites go away because the people who rely on them are not going to have a safe space to use drugs anymore. And so the ultimate reality is their risk of dying is going to go up as soon as these sites go away. If there are, in fact, 17 province-wide, and I think is it only one now left in Northern Ontario? If that's the case, what's a, give us some better numbers. What do we need, actually? Oh, that, that, is, that is hard to say, but I would say we need to multiply that many-fold as a starting point. We really need to think about the North, which is the part of our province that actually has the highest rates of opioid-related deaths and the fact that we have one site up there. And we also need to be creative. It may be that in more rural, remote parts of the province, we need different solutions. We need mobile solutions. A brick-and-mortar, you know, supervised consumption site may not be the solution in every single community or region that needs it, but we need to have those conversations and talk with communities and people who use drugs within those communities to see what they need, how it can be tailored to their needs, and how we can rapidly scale up these services to those communities. I want to give you another chance to hit this nail on the head because uh, I'm sure people watching this program now have seen either documentaries or news footage of, of, of some safe, what do you call it? I called it injection, but you call it safe. Consumption. Consumption yeah. sites, which are frightening to look at because there are some of the most vulnerable people in our society in these sites who look like they are doing significant harm to themselves. And if you're not a professional and you're looking at it with a layperson's eyes, you are thinking, what in heaven's name is going on here? Mm -hmm. So tell it, get, give us a better understanding of why you really believe that's the way to go. I guess I'll start by saying one thing. We are losing seven people every single day in this province to preventable, accidental mm -hmm. toxicities from drug use. I, I'm really afraid we're forgetting those numbers and we're getting used to that being a reality. And I'm not comfortable with that being a reality. We need to find ways to prevent these deaths. And so what these sites are doing is providing a way for people to stay safe when using drugs. And I think I would urge people to think about the alternative. If you don't have community-based programs with people who are there to help support people, who use drugs to keep them safe while using drugs, but also they play a really pivotal role in connecting people to other services within their community. If you take that away, it's not going to stop people from using drugs. In which case, in our last 30 seconds, there's every likelihood somebody from the Ministry of Health or from the mental health and, mental health and addictions part of the ministry will get a transcript of this interview. And you can give them some free advice right now. What do they need to do? First of all, recognize the urgency of how many people are dying and do that publicly and, and use that to inform your decisions. And secondly, and I know this is a hard ask, but take the politics out of this. There is clear evidence around how we can keep providing evidence-based treatment and doing it in a really, really well-adapted way to people's needs. And there's really clear evidence around the benefits of various harm reduction programs like safe consumption sites and safer supply programs. So rely on the evidence, engage with communities, find out what they need and how you can help financially support the investments needed to put in place those various different evidence-based programs within the communities that need them. That's epidemiologist Tara Gomes. Tara, as always, thanks for coming into TVO and sharing your views on this. Thanks for having me. His renown began with music, but Tom Wilson didn't stop there. A writer, an artist, and someone who's only recently discovered his Mohawk heritage. We caught up with him at the Cultural Goods Gallery in Toronto. My name is Thomas George Lazar, De Ohahaga, Two Roads. I come from a family of Mohawk chiefs, peacemakers, and peacekeepers, warriors and man-eaters, lacrosse magicians, tobacco salesmen, gangsters, shaman, shit disturbers and survivors. But instead of growing up around these heroes, I grew up on the East Mountain of Hamilton, Ontario, where a whole other tribe of madness prevailed. I'm a living, breathing lie, an embarrassment a married man's mistake and a young girl's only chance to hop a fence out of town and escape into freedom. The truth robbed me of my golden heart. I'm 64 years old and 10 years ago, 
I found out from a complete stranger that the people who raised me, the loving people that raised me, Bunny and George Wilson, were not actually my parents and that I was adopted, illegally adopted. Um, later, I found out driving my cousin Jane Lazar home from one of my grandson's birthday parties. Uh, I was driving her home and I said, Janie, I found out a short time ago that mom and dad aren't really my mom and dad. If you can ever tell me anything about this, would you please? And she turned to me and said, Tom, I don't know how to tell you this. I'm sorry and I hope you forgive me, but I'm your mother. Janie has been in my life my entire life. She's been the uh, image at the corner of the photograph, right against the edge of the frame. Never really in my life, but always close to it. Um, my, my mother, who I knew as my cousin Jane Lazar, is Mohawk from Ganawage. My father, uh, Louis Bova, was Mohawk from Ganawage. I grew up thinking I was a big, puffy, sweaty Irish guy when I'm in fact uh, a Mohawk from Gunawan. My belief, of course, is that we're all born artists. The ages of two, three, four, we all sing songs freely, we all dance, we make up stories, we act out characters, and we draw with absolutely no inhibition. And as I started to paint, I started to feel that three-year-old come out of me. And anybody who works to be an artist is working to get back to that three or four-year-old self that we sadly left behind once we walked through the doors of school. These colors and these images are, are my ancestors screaming to be heard. It was 15 years ago that my daughter said to me, Dad, you have to stop painting like this. This is cultural appropriation. And being a knucklehead from Hamilton, I said, I don't even know what you're talking about. I don't know what that means. She said, it's when you take someone else's culture and use it for your own benefit. And I said, well, this is just what's coming out of me. I've known Tom for quite a while, I guess since uh, around the late 70s, uh, mostly through music. I was in, in Hamilton uh, booking bands and, and bars and, and part of the music scene in Hamilton at the time. Uh, I started moving towards art as Tom's uh, music career evolved and um, I think he started painting sometime in the early 90s uh, and, and painting on his amplifiers and guitars and I thought that was interesting. Also, he used to visit me at my studio when I lived in Montreal, and so we used to have conversations not only about uh, music, but also uh, about art as well. And then I think it was around 2015 uh, when Tom uh, discovered his uh, indigeneity, and he went deep into uh, visual arts, into painting. And so he invited me to his studio, which uh, a small studio on, on James North and Hamilton. And I uh, visited him there. I thought it was really remarkable what he was doing and, and just trying to, let's say, negotiate his way uh, through visual art as a tool to understand his own history, his identity, where he came from, where it might be going to. It's the desire to get home. Ganawage sits on the south shore of the St. Lawrence Seaway, 20 minutes outside of Montreal, Quebec, just across the Mercier Bridge. The dream that I had since I was five or six years old, and it was a reoccurring dream that uh, I can't tell you, countless amount of times it stirred me in my sleep, was I'm standing um, as a young boy on the side of a, a, a river, a body of water, water's going by, it's nighttime, and I'm looking across at a piece of land that's uh, shadowed, shadowed in the, in the darkness, deep greens and deep blues. And I don't know how to get across the river. And the man who I knew as my Uncle John, who turns out to be my grandfather, 
he comes to me and he says, get on my back, I'll take you across the river. So I get on John Lazar's back and I start to go across the river and as we get about halfway across the river, he morphs, transforms, shape shifts into a giant turtle. And suddenly I'm on the back of this giant turtle and he starts to lift off the water, almost like he's gonna fly. And every time the dream ends right there. I think that that's some shape of blood memory itself. That was me. That was my blood recognizing that I was not home yet. And that dream was showing me the way to get there. As an artist, all you can possibly do is try to bring somebody face to face with your work for a moment just to be in the moment. This piece, uh, this piece represents a culture rising out of an attempt at assassination. This vibrancy, these colors, these crows on these warriors' heads are overcoming uh, the rape, murder, and robbery of its culture. Maybe this is a reflection that we need to look at. They tried to bury us, but they didn't know that we were seeds. So this is, this is the indigenous culture rising again through art, as Louis Riel said we would. These are a nun's habits, and inside these habits are the names of children found buried uh, on the property of residential schools. It's, a, it's an intense piece of work. It was an intense piece of work to create, to take these children's names and the dates they died, some just infants, and write them into these habits was not an easy task. It was not uh, something that didn't come with a weight that stayed with me and stays with me today. I paint for the lost children buried in the ground of abandoned residential schools. I paint for the generations of my family who worked the high steel, building North America into the sky. I paint for my family who filled out their wills at their kitchen tables and went into the woods to fight the Canadian Army in the war we call Oka Crisis in 1991. I paint for my mother who from the age of six attended day residential school her teacher told her every day to stand up with the rest of the Mohawk children in her class and take a good look around the room. Take a good look at each other because you're looking at the last Indians that this world is ever going to see. This painting is called Ganawage, The Long Road Home. It's a self-portrait. The two faces indicate the two worlds that I come from. Ganawage where my blood is from and the place that I was robbed and taken to is Hamilton, Ontario. Before I got my Mohawk name, I painted this. My Mohawk name is Deo Hahaga, which is two roads. It represents me perfectly. This is my favorite painting. I hope it never sells. Um, I hope that it hangs in my living room to the day I die. My mother believed that she was one of the last Indians. On her 80th birthday, she told this story to me, her son, my kids, her grandkids, and my two grandsons, her great-grandchildren. That's four generations of Mohawks, so she is not the last Indian. She's a survivor, and through her, I stand as a result of this country's greatest sin. This is uh, titled The Warrior. And like um, a lot of my paintings, uh, I try to make them colorful and inviting and loving, which is the juxtaposition of the theory of the dead Indian. Uh, the dead Indian is a uh, product of colonialism. The dead Indian is the noble warrior, often Lakota. Uh, the dead Indian is put in a safe place behind glass 
with animals that have become extinct. Uh, the dead Indian is mocked in cartoons and TV shows and laughed at by fools. So this painting, the warrior is a warrior of love, warrior of the ability to be able to do the right thing. And because of his vibrant colors and his good nature, is, uh, is a warrior against colonialism's dead Indian. I've been writing songs, lyrics, since I was 14 years old. Words are a part of the creative process for me. These words I was actually trying to read before we did this little filming here, and I couldn't make a lot of them out. But uh, in the past, I've opened up my computer, or I've printed out documents that I've been working on for my new book, Blood Memory. And I take those words and I start transcribing them into the paintings. And then I kind of leave that behind and it turns into a stream of consciousness. Uh, once again, elaborating on what I had written originally. And then uh, I have found myself because I figured what I just wrote into these paintings is actually better than what I wrote in my computer for the book. So I have to go back to the paintings and transcribe from the paintings back onto my computer or onto the page what I, uh, what I wrote in that moment. I mean, this is, this is our search, right? I mean, the words, the detail in these, this is, this is grasping the moment that we're in. This is... Uh, the creative moment, you know, we have to savor that. Starting in the 2000s, uh, there has been a greater awareness and really a renaissance uh, among Indigenous artists in Canada in particular. And I think Tom is part of that, uh, that voice in this century that is talking, uh, uh, referring to their history and their culture how it fits into uh, the discourse of today, trying to understand how that was almost uh, eliminated through history, and also trying to imagine what the future of their culture might be based on what's happening now and based on history. It's about going forward, I think, in a, in a lot of ways. Uh, and there are many artists, a, a number of them that I've worked with, uh, but right across Canada, also in film, in literature, in theater, and visual arts as well. So this is a really exciting time, uh, I think, for, for Indigenous art in Canada, and, and Tom is part of that uh, movement. The eyes originally were to be coming from, you know, not this planet, that's for sure. They were, they were universal understanding, universally understood. Um, people try to get their own interpretation for the eyes. Uh, I always have this line running down them so that people assume that it's a highway, it's a road, you know, which, which is not wrong. Um, it's, it's for interpretation, but I find that it's a good basis for everywhere else I'm going to go. I even put human eyes in my crows. The only eyes that I don't put, the only subjects I don't put human eyes in are, are the fish that I draw. So it's an important uh, place for me to start. And, and I don't sketch things out. I don't approach this canvas with a pencil and delicately, you know, sketch out where everything is going to be. It drives my wife crazy. She says, how do you do this? Why, do you, why don't you use a pencil and sketch out your paintings? It's, I go with actual oil and I start painting. And uh, I do the outlines. And a great place to start is with the eyes, for me. And after that, I paint with my hands. So all this is, is all painted in with my hands, and then the detail is with uh, oil pen. Let me put some sugar where they put salt. The mistakes you made aren't all your fault. Let me seal your scars and ease your mind. Turn your deep blue heart into the loving kind. How does it feel to be lying by yourself? 
You're out, oh, you deal. Tell me, how does it feel? Faded Memories of Home is an installation of nine school desks. The installation is to represent the loss of identity, the loss of color, the loss of language, the loss of love and the sense of family, the cruel joke made by the churches and the Canadian government against Indigenous children who were robbed from their homes and forced into these schools. The nine desks all have photographs of families burned into the tops, including my great-grandfather, Chief Peter Lazar. And as you move back in the desks, the images start to disappear, start to fade, representing the loss of all those ingredients that make us full human beings. And then there's two nuns, eight-foot nuns, that are uh, standing at the front of the classroom. And uh, a film that I put together from uh, National Film Board, clips, pictures of Disneyland, pictures of cartoons representing the dead Indian that I talked about earlier. And this exhibit has been shown at McMaster University. It's been shown at uh, Stratford Festival for a season. And uh, most recently at Queen's University uh, and on Tyndanaga Mohawk Territory. Um, I hope this uh, piece continues uh, to travel because uh, I'm learning that the impact that it has on people, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous, is, uh, is mighty and it leaves us wanting to continue a conversation. And if you really want to know what this gets down to, why I stand on stage and, and read from my books and sing the songs I do and why I write the books that I do and why I create this art, it's to, to hopefully have, create something that resonates with people enough that they start their own conversation, that they don't have to be told by the government or the churches or corporations to have the conversation, that they don't have to be told by news outlets to have the conversation, that art, art creates a conversation that needs to happen in this country. On the agenda. So from 2021 until 2023, which is only two years, the need for rural general practitioners doubled from 100 to more than 200. So we are losing physicians more rapidly from the north. That's tomorrow on the agenda.